Chile, in Italian, full Italian, Salucci. Go to the library. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening to those uh, uh, attending here in person and to all those that watch online uh, through our YouTube channel. Uh, again, uh, yet another pleasure to be organizing and celebrating uh, this episode, if I may say, or this edition of the BK Talks. Tonight, uh, the BK Talks is called Copyright, and uh, it comes from the initiative uh, of the uh, program and director of the faculty of the li uh, library of the University of TU Delft, Vincent Cellucci. I will give him the word immediately, and, and then we will go uh, into the content. Uh, it was really nice to have started this collaboration with, uh, I don't know, is it like three or four months ago, uh, I received an email from Vincent and he said we should do something together and we uh, had a couple of lunch meetings and we finally uh, brainstormed about the topic of tonight's, uh, tonight's uh, event. Vincent, I would like you to uh, come over here to the stage, say just a couple of words about how this happened, what you do. Sure. Thank you, Javier. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, in person and online. Um, Again, I'm Vincent Salucci. I work for the TU Delft Library. Uh, this spring, we've done a, a program on reinterpretation, and that's been combined uh, with an exhibition entitled Redesign Rietfeld. Uh, so if you haven't been to the library, it's up for a few more weeks. Um, and we've had a program in which uh, we sort of look at the lens of reinterpretation, specifically in design. Uh, but also, uh, we wanted to take a little bit more of a transdisciplinary approach, and that was a part of the reason why I wanted to reach out to Javier, and uh, we conducted tonight's panel together and conceived of it. Um, and so, we also wanted to be a little bit more critical. We're sort of thinking about, okay, reinterpretation, uh, odes, homages, and we'll, we'll get into some of these things to have a little bit more of a positive connotation, uh, but then also thinking about... Um, you know, copying is a, is a negative connotation and, and how pervasive that is within our society and even within design culture, if you think about uniqueness. Um, and then we started to think about, um, you know, what, what disciplines are actually, uh, and what sort of concepts have a little bit more of a positive or, or trendy uh, resonances with copying and, and copying right. Uh, and since so Javier introduced me to the Y Factory and Felix, our moderator's publication, uh, uh, with the cleverly titled pun, copyright as a, a imperative. And uh, we started thinking about, well, why is, uh, you know, sometimes this is uh, valued, sometimes this is criticized. Um, do we need to recheck in to these values? Um, and, you know, is this different in different disciplines? And, you know, where are we seeing copying today uh, happening? You know, we came up with some ideas of biomimicry, artificial intelligence, um, historic preservation. Uh, these sort of things, and so uh, then we got to the, one of the lectures of working at a, a top university is that we have experts to uh, sound off on these fields. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. Um, but uh, looking forward for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vincent. Um, I should turn this on. Um, so, I think Vincent already mentioned what uh, many of the topics that we will be discussing today. Uh, for me, um, copy, uh, right, copying, or evolving, or replicating, etc., is something that started at the Wife Artery by knowing the work of Felix Madrazo, who will be moderating uh, uh, here uh, tonight. And uh, I would like to start with this image because this is an event which you all probably know. This is the burn of the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris that happened on, in April 2019. Back then I was the editor of uh, the magazine Domus in Milan. 
uh, that they, they we received the news that the that the uh, cathedral was burning. And we were like many, most of us were shocked about the event, and we decided to do something about it. So immediately, Domus sort of reacted to it, and we decided to look at not only what has happening, but I probably you all know these images. No, you all know all the proposals that were launched a few days later about what to do with the. Uh, what to do with the uh, cathedral if you have to rebuild it, no? Do you rebuild it just like it was, or do you rebuild it in a different manner, etc., etc.? No? So many architects did so many proposals that we could have spent hours and hours looking at them, no? Some of them are very original, some ones are not that original, but what I found more striking is the fact that there was this tendency to criticize everything that was being proposed. No, so, um, and I sort of doing this, uh, preparing this article for Domus sort of understood that maybe we should look at things a little bit more objectively and see what is it that is there to learn from all this cascade of proposals about the new Notre Dame. No? Uh, later, we did this studio with our students, which is called the, uh, the which was called the New Old. And uh, I think Carola was actually a design critic at that moment. And with our students, we uh, produce a video a video that I'm going to try to, to, show, uh, to show now. The video is like, goes like this. Let me see. Yes. It's a three-minute video that summarizes quite well. On the 5th of uh, April, we 2019, Notre Dame burned down. An embodiment of the permanence of history was brought down. After the fire was under control, it took less than 24 hours for the French president, Macron, to promise the cathedral's reconstruction. Nous avons tant à Alors oui, nous rebâtirons la cathédrale Notre-Dame plus belle encore. Et je veux que cela soit achevé d'ici cinq années. French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe further announced an architectural competition for the reconstruction. Meanwhile, the world's super rich mobilized with astonishing speed, collectively pledging almost a billion euros to the reconstruction in just days. Soon as architects and designers started speculating interventions, Notre Dame became the world's favorite target for whataboutism. By adding a waterway, nautical mobility has increased. Adding a dome preserves Notre Dame and extends its lifespan. By branding Notre Dame or making it a Louis Vuitton headquarters, income has increased. A rocket launch pad increases interplanetary mobility. A greenhouse feeds the inhabitants of Paris. Adding a stained glass roof makes the place identity become even stronger. By adding a rooftop swimming pool, inclusivity is strengthened. A circus might increase diversity. A square creates public space. Or Notre Dame can be used as a parking lot to improve on Paris's parking crisis. A forest captures pollution. The fountain decreases the heat island effect. And a roof made out of mist offers a cool public space on a warm summer's day. In extensive discussions on how to rebuild the cathedral, architects promoted innovation. The renowned architect, Massimiliano Fuxa, stated, The goal is to create a contemporary structure that dialogues perfectly with the ancient presence. The thing that is vincent is always to put together the contemporary and the old. Un briciolo di tradizione e nostalgia purtroppo con una capacità di, 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 di leggere in, te, in termini contemporanei la storia, trovare un equilibrio fra le due cose. If all of this was possible, why did we choose to spend the 830 million euros on replicating the old? A replica of the traditional structure is not the perfect dialogue of a contemporary structure with an ancient presence. As Fuca stated, it is rather continuing a conservative monologue. Why replicate Notre Dame exactly as it was before the fire? Should cities and buildings remain forever as they are now? How about assessing the impact of other proposals before discarding them? Is there a tool capable of assessing possible actions on the existing before we make our choices? If not, shall we create one? Well, 
that's uh, a video that uh, tries to uh, summarize a little bit what we uh, were thinking uh, about all uh, how to make that architecture evolve, and I think this is food for thoughts for later. So I, I just want to give the word to the speakers. No, another of the another of the topics that we will be talking about today is something which is a little bit less uh, uh, how to say question uh, is the fact that uh, uh, there is nature and we want to uh, work, live, or design and as nature. No, so and um, what is interesting during our conversations with Vincent it was is it, it we seem that uh, it seems that biomimicry uh, or imitating nature in many many ways is something which is more legitimate and uh, there's no issues about it this is like a, something probably writer thing to do so this is another of the questions that we want to uh, to uh, address today and Probably there will be more other things, no? But uh, also, what I think is important to talk about is not only this, but also this, and this is what one of the things that we were trying to, uh, we would like to address uh, also today, no? This is uh, this is this is me giving class yesterday, and that is my students teaching me ChatGPT. So I didn't know anything about ChatGPT until two months ago. Uh, a colleague of mine talked to me about it and I was completely ignorant or I was not interested, I don't know. So yesterday we were teaching and we were talking about how do you name your uh, projects, how do you actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an editor, I love titles and I love to have slogans, etc., etc. and they told me, yes, yes, Javier, you just let us do. So they did the following. They were asking for a catchy title to talk about reforestry, uh, reforest in Czechia, no? And they wrote, write a catchy slogan for reforest in the Czech Republic using the imperative, make a list. And some really good titles started coming up. So this is something that I, I learned only yesterday. And today I did this exercise, which is to write a text, which I usually write for the Y Factory. And then I asked ChatGPT to write a text about the Y Factory in Y Factory style. And I ended up with the text starting saying, welcome to a world where the boundaries of imagination merge seamlessly with, an urban, with urban landscapes. So blah, blah, blah. I guess that, I don't know if Felix can react to that. He has written a lot. Uh, at the Y Factory, but for me it's been a discovery that I would like uh, to talk about. Besides, the, besides the, the fun of it, I think it's really important to see what we keep being uh, flooded in the last uh, weeks, I would say, or months. It's what is happening with AI, you know? and I would like also our panelists to react to, to uh, statements like this by Yuval Noah Harari, you know? saying that AI has hacked the operating system of hum human civilization, you know? or figures uh, like, uh, like the former AI uh, person in Google who said very recently that AI, that AI is a threat to the world, uh, which is maybe more urgent than climate change. No? So I don't know if this is right or this is true or not, but still it's really uh, something very important to think about. Anyway, I leave the floor to the, uh, to the panelists so that we can clarify some doubts. Uh, tonight uh, we have with us Carola, Bas, Saskia, Aime, and Seyron. Uh, moderated by Felix Madrazo. Felix Madrazo has been a colleague of mine for many, many years. He is the author of the book uh, Copy Paste, together with Vinny Mas at the Y Factory. And uh, he will be moderating the panel. I think nobody better than him, who has been working on how to copy not only, no, copy not only paste, and copy actually write. So, Felix, I give you the word. Thank you very much, and let's enjoy the evening. Thank you all. Thank you, Javier. Um, well, I'm very happy to be back to this uh, topic uh, after a few years. Um, I have to say that what we have done for copy-paste a few years ago uh, requires a kind of urgent update because there are so many tools that uh, have happened that uh, almost feel embarrassed. Part of one of the exercises that we're, we were doing in that studio was to do a Photoshop exercise where the students have to actually cut by hand, not by hand, but you know, with the, with the mouse, cutting the figures. And now in, you need one second to cut like any image. So, and not to mention, of course, artificial intelligence and everything that Javier has mentioned. So copy-paste needs an iteration, definitely a two-point series urgent. So that the, the themes that are we gonna be touching tonight, I think are, uh, I mean, exploring into that direction. The, and one of the things that is very interesting tonight, panelists, is the diversity of backgrounds uh, uh, from history, but also from science and design and artificial intelligence. 
So we didn't have back, the, back then this uh, support. We were only focused in architecture. What I think is very much this world of collaboration between all humans and perhaps artificial intelligence <laughs> that we could arrive to kind of interesting new results. Um, let me see if, I, if this works. Not yet. Maybe I need another one. Yeah, so I will ask uh, each of the panelists, in my, since my eyesight is not very good, to please give a briefing about your background. And then each of, you, each of the panelists will explain with one image a bit what their current interest for tonight's discussion is. So I'll give the word to, to Carola. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the organization of this event, which I think is very timely and important. So I'm Chair History of Architecture and Urban Planning with a great love for water, ports, and historic cities, which means that some of the examples will also be coming from the past, the longer past, and also the design of the future then. So I'm trained as an architect planner, which makes that I'm also always connecting the understanding of the past to the rethinking of the present and then the design of the future. When Javier first asked me, would you participate in an event on copyright, I think my mind switched right away to the opposite, copyright. So I would put, and if you want to put the next image, a question mark about it. And then Javier said, well, give us a slide of the very first thing that comes to your mind. And we just had the case of making a little video on Port Cities where the maker choose all kinds of objects. We had chose, talked about copyright forever, but she chose a little cloud from a painting for which we could not get the copyright. So we had to do the whole film over with another cloud. So this is a cloud that is free of copyright. So since then, all the images I chose are carefully CCBY licenses. And then I gave you a number of images because my mind works more than this cloud and right away there are more than one image popping up than the one that Javier was asking for. And I do think this question of copyright, particularly in this faculty, plays both to makers and to writers. So on the one hand, there's the question of copying architecture. And when we look at the Euro builds, for example, we see a lot of copied architecture. We see actually fake architecture because these are not even real buildings. And then when we look abroad and we look at the Isa Shrine, for example, that's a building that's rebuilt or buildings that are rebuilt every generation because the idea is not that the material should be old and in place, but the idea is that the knowledge about how to build it should be repeated every generation and be available. So even this theme of what is copied and how to copyright, which is where my question mark came from, is different from culture to culture. And then we look at the building, which almost looked like containers. We could also say the more we copy, the more people we reach, right? So should we build those Plattenbau type of buildings that I've been giving you on the screen? So that's a question for architecture. But on the other hand, we have people writing theses, PhDs. And then we put them through Authenticate, and the AI algorithm behind it will tell me, oh, this comes from this book, and that comes from that book. And all of a sudden, even words like the are being highlighted because you cannot use it, which raises huge questions for our students, in particular our uh, foreign students, who like to look at texts and learn from them, because language is also something you learn, we're asked to repeat, because that there's rules about it, but we cannot repeat nice sentences without quoting them. So we do look at these things through Authenticate all the time. So on the one hand, there's a need for open access. We are a public university. We are supposed to publish open access and make our work available. And I was just crossing Nathalie de Vries when I was walking, walking out, and she said, well, I'd rather be copied than to copy. And I think that's exactly the question also, where do we stand as humans? Because our intrinsic, or at least the intrinsic drive that we have is to be original or not doing things that we like, that, is, that are new and everyone to their own degree. 
So that's even a question of who wants to copy coloring in a book, children copy, to what degree do they copy or not. And then you have ChatGBT, and again, I had these discussions with my students. Well, if you use it, fine, get inspired from it, see if it really writes the story, but tell me that you do it, and then let's think about where your own agency sits. So in some ways, and I'll turn it back to you, the question is also, what do architects want to achieve? Because many businesses will go, how can we reproduce the most of our product to make the best for the world? So if architects want to be original and not be copied or be, have their object preserved and be unique, do we, are we actually able to achieve, for example, sustainability? Because then the best of the most sustainable buildings should maybe be copied all over. And maybe we can come back to that discussion. Thank you, Carola. That's very interesting things uh, that you were mentioning. Uh, we continue with the next guest, with Bas. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Bas Flipser. I call myself an industrial remaker, not so much a maker, which I was beforehand, but nowadays I try to well, keep products alive more uh, and by means of repair and by maintenance. And uh, if you look at the past, then we'll see a lot of products which are out there and in the, back in the 60s, 70s, you did not buy a product, you actually buy uh, kits where you can assemble stuff and then suddenly you had a radio and with the radio you can listen to everything. Nowadays you buy a radio or you're not even buying a radio anymore, but you buy something, a music device and if it fails, then you cannot uh, remake it or repair it. And I think uh, back in the 60s, 70s, it was so much easier because you know how it, how it looked like inside, the guts of it. And I've got a small picture of uh, an e-bike, which is uh, from uh, iFixit, where I worked for, for a couple of years. And this is one of those bikes which uh, we uh, took from China and we took it over here. And this was one of those first cheap e-bikes, uh, and I call it e-waste as well, because currently bikes... And that's the revolution in bikes. Uh, it was were very repairable, but the evolution in bikes is not that fast. Uh, it consists of uh, hundreds of parts back then when it when it's first conceived, and it consists of hundreds of parts or maybe thousands of parts uh, currently. And the only added value which is added nowadays is electronics. So every e-bike, every moped you see on on the streets now in current, uh, especially if you go uh, to foreign countries like, or for, to Paris for instance, or Brussels, where the discussion is going on on, on e-bikes and e-mopeds, which you can hire, it's e-waste standing out there, and we don't know what to do with it anymore. I believe in opening up hardware, I believe in open hardware, I believe that we should share knowledge, we should share uh, how things are constructed, how things are designed, how the product architecture is uh, opening up and we can repair it so we can extend the life of products and that's, that's how I see the future and not closing down which, with IP rights uh, and everything else. I think uh, we should finally open up more. So this is uh, my point I wanted to make. And I fix it because it's now already for 20 years, so we're out uh -huh, there nice. for a long time. Still works. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Bas. Saskia, could you please... Uh Yes, so hi everybody, my name is Saskia van der Muizenberg. I'm one of the founders of Biomimicry in the Netherlands. And I think what I'm bringing to the table tonight is... Um, I do agree with you, Carola, that we should copy all the things <laughs> that are making our world a better place. And I do that by looking at nature, that is what Biomimicry stands for. Um, and sometimes you can see designs also in architecture that are very much mimicking nature or maybe an exact copy. Uh, for instance, if you have like a barrel cactus, it is shading itself, so it's not evaporating all the precious moisture inside. And there are now already buildings who are applying that, so they do have a self-shading mechanism which can be really smart. So I think um, copying is great, as long as you copy for the right reasons. Um, so there's, there's many examples out there. Um, what I would, maybe if we can show that uh, my slide, 
This is at a bit of a different level because we can look at nature to, as a model for new innovations. Um, but we could also look at nature more as a, as a benchmark or as a measure. And, well, each field has their own guru. For us, it's uh, Janine Benyus. And at some point, when she was, she lives in Montana in the US, and uh, when she was flying in a plane and looking down, she was asking herself, why aren't our cities functioning the same as natural ecosystems? How could we mimic that? How could we also maybe provide those ecosystem services? And that thought led to a large project, Project Positive, which is maybe the next slide, and also the approach. So we are currently working also in the Netherlands um, with some, um, some partners in the built environment to make their, their buildings and even industrial sites look at them uh, and compare them to the natural ecosystem that would have been there if there was not anything built there by humans. And we can collect all the data of what that natural ecosystem would produce. For instance, um, how much water it would collect, um, how much water it would purify, how much air, how much biodiversity, how much CO2 it would store. And then we take that as a benchmark for everything we built. So can our cities, our buildings do the same? And to, if you start measuring that, you get a huge gap <laughs> in performance. Um, but then we start looking at those nature's create, creations. That's where the creativity part comes in. Because we, yes, we look at these organisms, but we don't really exactly copy them. It's more emulating the underlying principles and apply them to whatever we want to design. And um, so in the future, I, I would hope that each architecture starts thinking that way. Because I, I asked myself for a long time, there is this iconic example of uh, a large office building in Harare, Zimbabwe, that has looked at how termite mounts don't need any extra ventilation system. They apply that into the building, so it doesn't have any air conditioning, and it can maintain a stable temperature, whereas the temperature at night is maybe zero degrees Celsius, and during the day it's 40. Why is not everybody doing it? So sometimes I think ego is in the way of copying. Um, and one maybe other point that I hope will come back into our discussion if you take inspiration for somebody else, then what can you do to repay them? How can you make it a sort of, um, well, more of a reciprocity process in it? How, and that is something we do in, within biomimicry. We would like to honor the organism or the system that we took inspiration from. And um, yeah. Very interesting, kind of fair, fair theft. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Saskia. Uh, we go to Dr. Amy, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Amy Sakis. I'm an assistant professor at the faculty of 3ME, just a little bit far, farther down the road. And uh, my research focuses basically on the design of medical instruments inspired by nature, so a little bit the same as what uh, Saskia does as well. So we, uh, what we do is we look into medical issues, medical problems that we can't solve right now, and then we look like how would nature solve these things. So for example, we have divide, uh, designed uh, wasp-inspired needles that can go through the body uh, without like causing much damage because they're very small. And um, by mimicking nature, I don't really like to call it mimicking, but more like inspiration, because we don't really recreate the animal exactly. We look into like the working principles behind it. So why is this animal like shaped like this? What does this uh, mechanism do? And how can we uh, recreate it, but maybe in a different way, and it will still have the same functionality? For example, sharks have certain scales that make them swim faster and have less drag, but we can recreate this uh, skin in a more simple way with just adding little riblets on, for example, swimsuits that's worn in the Olympics. So that's uh, basically what I do, and maybe I can go into the slides as well. So one thing as well that, of course, I'm... I'm uh, 
I'm aware and also working with is that a lot of medical data actually that we use nowadays in surgery and also other medical practices has been uh, collected not very ethically. So a lot of research was done uh, without people's consent uh, during wartime. And on the one hand, you think like maybe we shouldn't use this data because it's been gained unethically. But the other hand, if you don't use it, then uh, you can't help uh, people uh, with that information. So can we copy that information? Can we use that information? That's uh, always a little bit of a yeah, question that we have to ask. Other than that, um, maybe the next slide. <laughs> Um, also, if you like mimic nature for 100%, can you actually copyright it yourself? Can you actually say like, oh, this is my original work? If you get uh, inspired by nature and you change it and you design it in a way that it's not like it's inspired by it, but it's not 100% mimicking, then you can say, okay, I, I added something to this. But if, for example, you like 100% just mimic like uh, a certain part of an organism, is it then your IP or is it still like a nature which doesn't, which doesn't have IP? So that's something also to think about. Thank you. Uh, we will discuss all of these topics in the next discussion. Seyran. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Seyran. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Architecture and also uh, director of uh, AI lab uh, at the Department of Architecture here. Uh, I see that we have different point of view uh, on the topic and perspective, it's very interesting. Uh, so I have, uh, I would look at the copyright topic from the AI perspective, which is very popular right now and you see it all over the media, what happens uh, to the output of these AI models when the data is copyrighted, when it's not nature, when uh, you have to ask for consensus if uh, people agree to share this data, even though that is uh, not explicit, so it has been uh, implicitly put into these uh, AI models. Uh, that's, uh, I think, very interesting. It's unsettled, but a uh, very fascinating topic. Uh, I have, um, I would look at this from the three different angles. So if you go to my slides, um, from the design perspective, uh, I'm not a designer, my background is uh, computer science, but I've uh, been uh, among designers for a couple of uh, years now, and how I see the design problem uh, with a bit of flavor of computational thinking, uh, and what is the innovation uh, within this space of uh, design uh, what is creative problem solving and how is uh, related to uh, copyright uh, and um, I would say interpretability or uh, reproducibility. Uh, what do we mean if you say, okay, it's not 100% copied, what is this percentage? How do we quantify this? What is this complexity that brings uh, the, the uh, let's say, this trajectory uh, to the copyright uh, let's say, legalized or not. Uh, so these are the things that I think would be uh, interesting to look at it also a bit from the theoretical perspective uh, to understand how copyright works uh, in design, but also uh, in computation and in AI. Thank you very much, Seyran. Um, I think uh, we have a kind of a broad perspective now of the panelists' background and interest is very diverse, as you can see, and, uh, but we will try tonight to see where are the things that uh, are touching the common fiber of the topic of tonight. One of the things that, uh, that when we did the book was to see if we could get rid of the morality of copyright if it was co copying was considered bad, originality was considered good. The moment that you copy something, your teachers will make fun of you, or you will fail. But if you look in history with a bit of more time, humans have copied all the time, everything. And that was the normal thing. And even in education, it was a bit like that. There was these books on typologies that the students have to memorize and eventually apply them to the context, like Duran, etc. Carola knows them very well. Um, so 
copying and originality uh, became a bit contradictory in modernity because we were supposed to find innovative solutions that, that derive exactly from the problem. And we were not supposed to be looking at previous solutions because supposedly the program and the site in architecture terms were enough to give you the right answer to, to the brief. Uh, and that was a waste of energy, a waste of intelligence. We were wasting a lot of information from the past just for the sake of following what modernists were telling us to do. Now we know that this is not true and we can, of course, check the sources, go back in history, learn from any typology, even even if it's this typology from the first century or fifth or whatever. Which is one of the things which is very interesting in architecture and maybe not so easy to apply in, our, in other uh, sciences is that architecture is not that linear. We are able to go back into the sources without so much prejudice, uh, some, a bit like writers do. With science, what I noticed from the panelists is that what you're doing is you're looking back into history into the history of evolution, pretty much. To the history of evolution, uh, arriving at discoveries of how animals or plants or ecosystems operate and have a right to a kind of almost ultimate perfection through trial and error, basically. So that's some of the things which I find very interesting. So um, I wonder um, if, it's, uh, if it's fair that I will still keep the argument that copyright is, uh, uh, is still a good thing to do. I still believe so, but with the arrival of artificial intelligence, it becomes a bit more problematic. And so I was reading an article by Naomi Klein in The Guardian two days ago, and she's actually saying that, as uh, I mean, was saying, like, there's a lot of mining going on at the moment about scanning the world, without consent, right? So you are able to scan cities, architecture, faces, colors, concepts, everything you don't ask. And few companies that have the money and the power will collect all this data that for a few years will be free, but later will not be free. And that's one of the things that make me think that maybe we have to approach this a bit more carefully. So I would like to first start with this question of how do you feel about the idea not only of copying but of the vulnerability we have as creators with the arrival of these new technologies. And maybe Seyran, you are perhaps addressed as an <laughs> expert on computational in this faculty. Uh, I think this is a very important question and people are busy uh, trying to explore and study this uh, from different perspective, ethics, uh, morality, um, legal perspective, uh, technological perspective. Uh, so what happens uh, to the copyright or intellectual property of the data once it's used to create these models? So we are talking about corporation, uh, big companies that are actually producing these models and they're using all sort of data. I mean, uh, on paper, they are not allowed to use any data that is copyrighted. So if there are public or open access data, this is what they should actually use for training, for producing these models, not anything that is copyrighted. But we all know that uh, this is only on paper. So uh, there are digital uh, copies of copyrighted stuff out there, and people can just scrap it through web and make a data set and start training this model and creating these models based on that. What happened with ChatGPT as well, there are lots of content, textual content out there, and this model has been trained on this uh, large corpus of texts, which is basically a sort of collective uh, humanity wisdom. Uh, that's why they are so good. Uh, uh, so these are definitely unsettled. Uh, and 
my personal opinion is that as long as we are using materials, data to create these models, uh, we need to ask for permission. And if there are any uh, financial benefit coming out of this, this has to be calculated, which is super difficult uh, because of the very complex nature of these models uh, to be compensated to the, these creators. And uh, there are, I think, models that are being examined, uh, for example, blockchain models that they use uh, tokens to actually I um, uh, identify uh, these original artworks or any kind of, um, I would say, artifacts uh, to be traced back to this original source so that we can uh, avoid, uh, I would say, this leakage in these models without the maker, the creator, uh, being um, out of the picture, not being compensated. You are mentioning the creator as a kind of some individual genius. That, that's understandable, but what happens when the creator is the collective? And when you have Google scanning cities, scanning, you know, like uh, things which are more complex and they are not from one person, yet they have the data and they could derive uh, the principles to make a city a la Venice or a la whatever. Like, uh, I want to a bit go to what Carola was saying about it's okay to do it, and I also put it in the book, since we do it for the common good, right? Uh, do you still, after hearing these things, this, this uh, conversation, do you have any doubt that, we, that this might be misinterpreted like by big companies saying, well, we are doing it for the common good, right? So what's wrong with that? But I do think the, the question of the common good and maybe building on what we said before. So taking your example of the blockchain, so we link it back to something and that may also get the financial benefit because that would be ideal, right? So how do we link it back to the bee or to nature? So then we come to ecosystem thinking, which you mentioned. So if, and I'm skirting your question a bit, but I'll come back to it. But if we were to invent new things, building stones, like a Lego building where everybody comes up with something new but that fits its content and gives back to the locality where it actually has originated. Now what you are talking about is when this is grabbed and drawn away into a different area where that knowledge is being used for financial purposes and not for the greater good. So then it really comes down to ethics and morality. Now, that brings me back to what I was trying to say in the beginning, the individual knowledge. So we can say we have actors, musicians, whatever, the genius out there, and everybody imitates the genius. But we lose the knowledge of handling our own bodies, our own brains, whether I use a language translator or I, I learn a language, right? Makes me a different human being. Kids, children learn from us from copying us, that's how we learn language. Yeah. But the fact that we add our personal thing to it makes it unique. And I think that's also in some ways the cells, if you go to the cellular level, they fill the spot and the role they have and they give back to the place where they are. So it's not 100% ask, answering your question, but maybe the point is also as soon as we create a greater level that is not forced to constantly give back and to turn it to architecture or planning or ports, well, the ships are out on the ocean carrying the containers, the pollution goes into the maritime world and nobody pays for it. So it's maybe cheaper to send a container over and buy whatever because we are not forced to live in the actual nat natural environment and that's where some big companies often cream off the, the benefits. So. Not sure if it answers your question or if it goes around it. No, no, it does, but uh, I, I start to get a little bit worried about, uh, about uh, this aspect of uh, our naivety because I am a total fan, as Bas, of open source and open software and open uh, everything. <laughs> and then being companies are like, yeah, you are, you are doing a perfect job for us because, you know, yeah, but are we already too late then? 
aren't we? It, the, 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 the AI is already built upon knowledge which is out there and not having tokens there, not having blockchain there. So we cannot trace it back anymore where this knowledge came from. And it's already a large set, I think. It's going to be increasing in the upcoming years. And then finally in five years, we have found a system which pays off. And that's interesting. Uh, these are very slow processes because we have to standardize everything. We have to normalize everything. I think we might even already be be too late because Google might do it in five years and they, they put everything in, behind a, a paywall and then suddenly all our knowledge and all our creativity of our life, of all the artists which are in there now is behind a paywall, which is kind of strange, isn't it? Aren't we too late then? That's a question. Yeah, uh, I think not for everything because from nature there's still a lot to do, right? Like, uh, and that's why it's so exciting, because you can still learn a lot. And, but are you able to patent, for example? Like, if you, I, I know this example, the, the wings of the owl are very silent when they, when they fly, right? So now they scan them to the microscopic level, and now there's a new material that can make very, that it, for windmills, that could be very silent. But then there's a patent. So are we gonna now patent? All of these nature inventions, or and who is going to protect the creators? I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's of course quite difficult. But I think it depends on like if you actually mimic it 100%. If you just like you can't like patent the owl, right? <laughs> you can't be like, okay, I hold the patent to an owl or <laughs> the snake. That's my invention. They're patenting seeds nowadays, so actually <laughs> nature is being patented. So it's, I think you can. They put it in what? Seeds. No. Oh. So they're cross, uh, cross, uh, crossing uh, fertilizer, or crossing uh, seeds, and then yeah. it was a skill, but nowadays it's chemistry and it's being patented. That's very interesting, of course, because basically nature's not copyrighted. So, yeah, like in theory, you could do it, right? Because nature, you can do whatever you want uh, with nature as well. Is it ethical? I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think, for example, the research on the owl, like if you actually research why it's silent and based on why it's silent, you develop something that's like slightly different but has the same working principles, then you can say like you actually have the right to but own that, yeah. Yeah. Saskia, you were very optimistic. Uh, you are still very optimistic. Yeah, well, I, I don't think people can, um, will be able to really patent the, um, the underlying mechanism of how the owl does it, maybe the application of it, how they applied it, as you say. And also, um, well, we use a lot uh, a website called asknature.org. So this is like a database of all these biological functions. And one of the thing, the thinking behind it is to make that public so that everybody can learn from those strategies and mechanisms so they cannot be patented because it's out in the open. Um, so that, that could be a way around it. So I also think, yeah, it's um, a bit scary to, that you can patent seeds <laughs> and maybe like, uh, uh, yeah, rabbits, but I don't think we, get, we will go that far. And also to the point of, um, of maybe having these big organizations putting all the data behind firewalls. I don't think we, we will live long enough to see it, but at some point, every time in history, we see that it, whenever there is too much power in one centralized location, there will be upheaval, revolution, something happening. Maybe uh, we should patent <laughs> ourselves then, huh? Yeah. Well, can we not protect already, ourselves then from being used by yeah, uh, but other it's, people? It's already scary that, that your voice could be cloned with just three words, right? You just say three words and the computer already yeah. is able to imitate. So now we have to, what, patent ourselves for everything? Or like fingerprints, everything? Like, yeah. isn't it pat weird or pathetic? It is. The rest of nature works mostly open source. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and also think AI mostly is inspired by our own neural networks and is, that, that, is that nature is inspired, That's right? interesting because 
we were just discussing before uh, we started the conversation that when this research started, somehow was a bit, uh, nobody believed so much in it. You, you know, maybe you're a computer scientist, you, you can explain a bit more that it, it was like a bit slow, right? Yeah, this is on a hype, so people have been doing this for years, uh, 50 years or so. It's, it's not new, uh, but we got this momentum because of the computational power and data. So these are two ingredients that are very important to make this happen. Uh, because it's interesting because all these AI models were also inspired uh, by brain, by Bio human mimicry. brain, right? So we call it artificial neural networks because, yeah, they are mimicking the way we actually learn and the, la the learning framework is very much close uh, to what we do as human. And we have faith in it because I think this is working through evolution. So we think AI is going to work because it's based on this concept. I mean, that's uh, more or less the, uh, I think, in enthusiasm behind it. But, and playing off what Saren was saying, because this is the example where we basically started when we looked at teaching AI to match images, historic images. That's, that's where the project, one of the projects started. And I basically asked Sarah, can we also make a feminist algorithm? So an algorithm that actually says, this is what you're not seeing. Because what scares oh, me then is that the new models replicate what we see yeah. or what we perform. Yeah, yeah. So a woman in a white dress will be the nurse and a man in a white dress will be the doctor, very basically. Or uh, this famous image of you train an algorithm to find a dog and the, do the, the algorithm will even find a dog in a pot of spaghettis, right? So it, it goes into overdrive of what we're already doing. And so when we played a bit with ChatGBT, you find almost all the high school essays of the US in five paragraphs, intro, conclusion, middle. I mean, so you find structures that we've been performing over and over again. But I do think the, the innovation, why I perhaps am staying an optimist in some ways, is that we are able to identify those gaps. And that's where also our creativity and criticality can be sitting. And one way, and I mean, this might just be a question back to you, all these discussions now on giving a voice to non-humans or giving a voice to the living would then say, well, what does the bee, what does the river, whatever, say or what is their intrinsic need in this whole story? Nice, more than human, yeah. That's, uh... But then, again, I think it's great that we be getting into that space because at least we start to sort of empathize or try to think for them, but we still do it as humans. Yeah. So can we really know what the bee is thinking or is it what we think the bee would be thinking if I was a bee? And, um, yeah. <laughs> And, and I think I the know. question becomes, it's not so much is it the, to put the I into the B, yeah. but to think about their ecosystem and understand what the yeah. circularity of the living spaces would be. Sure. But this is, uh, in a way, the, begin, the, the help of artificial intelligence is that you are now able to understand or kind of understand that the whales are singing certain songs, right? Or just without the artificial intelligence, you will never be able to do that, right? So the tools are there in a way to decode nature, in a way that can be super interesting to, to see how uh, uh, several kind of uh, health issues or many things could be uh, absorbed into the human uh, needs. So I, I totally agree on that. But um, is there a, a kind of limit to where are we where are we standing? And um, can computers um, become, uh, well, they are, already start to become not only artificial intelligence, but they're what they call artificial general intelligence, which is like also decoding what the human wants to think. You have heard these conversations with the, with the journalists and the chat GPT in which about uh, uh, detecting that the guy actually wants uh, maybe to dump his girlfriend and the computer starts to tell him, maybe you should get rid of your girlfriend, your girlfriend is boring. And, and okay, so computers are able to go 
much much further than that we expected. So, what for architecture students, what is very interesting for me to think is that if all this artificial intelligence is about language, and we can decode everything about language, uh, we don't need to draw anything anymore. In a way, we can just type keywords and play with those keywords, and it's it makes. Uh, parametric architecture looks so prehistoric, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like. Is that true? Can you actually describe yeah. the building with its all elements just by language? Yeah. Do you have not done? You have not tried me journey. <laughs> well, um, I think I'm amazed by what it can do, like text to image generation models, but still image. So you want to convert text to image for a reason, because there is something in, in visuals. I mean, half of our cortex is uh, dedicated to, to visual processing. And for me, um, architecture is exceptionally very visual. Uh, people are communicating their design ideas very much through visuals than, than text, so I'm a bit Surprised that you're saying that we can s sort of solve architecture once, with architecture with text. Once it's decoded, once it's decoded, uh, it becomes a sequence of, of, of words. I mean, when I was but writing I that book that of copy paste, I totally disagree. <laughs> I, I, when I was writing the book of uh, copy paste, the historian George Kubler basically was saying that we basically have the source, which is the archetype of like that, and the replicas that everybody copies the replica, right? So we are always kind of copying, 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 until finally somebody becomes better than the source or becomes better than the genius or the master, and then a new type is emerged. But he also says something which is find very interesting, is that it's not only about the exact visual shape of what is a Gothic cathedral, but the precise language description of what is a Gothic cathedral, which is a sequence of uh, vaulted elements arranged in a, so algorithms. So language convert <laughs> to architecture. That is very likely to happen. You don't believe in that. Well, this, this is, and I, I forgot which philosopher it was, but it, it, it's a way of thinking where if we describe, if I would describe you, or That's let okay. me, uh, some, something else. Do you, do you have a partner? Or did you ever have a partner? <laughs> and if you think of this person, yeah, 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 you, 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 you can describe this person as, oh, it's this, uh, this tall and um, you know, brown eyes and blah, 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 all the things that we can see. Yeah. But it's not saying anything about how you, how you feel about it. And there may be things that you cannot even express in words, how you feel something about it. It's not that the, 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 same, the one Gothic cathedral is the same as the other, even if they would be exactly the same, I think there, there is a heart and energy into it that can be totally different that we cannot describe in words. Okay, but you are now going almost spiritual, but because now the technology, if, if there's a scanner and it scans my brain and it will produce a picture of my wife with high accuracy, just by scanning my yeah, brain. Yeah. Okay, maybe the computer doesn't know what my wife is thinking right now, but we are not very far from understanding that this certain that our brain patterns already can produce the image that we are thinking. Yeah. Well, I think maybe it's a next step in in evolution that we are creating some sort of next level species <laughs> with with this technology. Hmm? Switch. And I don't so, know if you so want to be happy with that. <laughs> But isn't there also a question, text is always linear, and a vin an image you can take in in one go. So that your eye also produces other links that haven't been there. And I would go also with, your, with the more sociocultural dimension of it. So there's a drawing, but the drawing is not the building. And the building is hot or cold, has a smell, etc., etc. All of this you're not yet reproducing. You might get a hint of it in a novel and a writing, but it's not the same li li lived feeling when you hug a column, right? So when you think about who we are as humans, and let me give one example. I always ask my students to do mental maps. 
So what stands out to them? How they grew up, and this was the, bar the, the, the corner where the barking dog was, and I couldn't, wasn't allowed to get any further. And then you get notes like, oh, the bench where I had my first kiss, right? And all of a sudden, this bench you can describe may have been an ugly concrete bench, whatever, but the meaning of the bench you're not capturing in that drawing itself. So the drawing itself is only a, a means in between of translating some compositional effects, but its architecture is much more than just the stones I put agree. together. I agree, it's much more. I, I totally agree that it's much more, and the phenomenological aspects and the memories and all of these we, is still not in artificial intelligence. But I would, I would bet that it will come soon. I want to ask you something now in our last round of questions. What would you tell students to be aware of? Because if you ask ChatGPT, what are the careers that we should, uh, that will be left after this revolution, it says the only careers left are the ones that are connected to empathy and stuff which are more difficult to, for a computer to imitate. But what will you tell students of architecture which are, may, are watching this video regarding how, should education remain the same as we still have it? Is it like, do we still need to learn the history of architecture, Carola? <laughs> or should we instead focus on learning how the owl, uh, you know, like, what, where should we stand now? It's going very fast. So they, they already are using ChatGPT to make the report. So. And it's perfectly fine if as long as they are aware of what it does to them. I mean, maybe you start on one end, we've been going back to handwritten exams. I cannot say that I particularly enjoy reading them, but at least that time you have to have the actual creativity of the person in front of you. And I do think that, and, and these may open a whole other range of discussions, but again, I think it's about the personality and the personal learning and particularly your own values. Who do you want to be? And I think you, each of us, and we have brilliant students, so all of these brilliant students that I'm talking to, they should trust their own instinct and the power of their own learning. So I'd rather have a conversation on whatever, whatever the first sentence of an article if they didn't read the rest, and I can get as much out of that conversation and inspire them to do things. So the trust in their own capacities, they don't need to copy because they want to be a complete human being. And then it's about, for me, it's about values. The motto of Theo Delft, and I keep on repeating this, is technology for a better society. So let's work on the concept of what is this better society, what role can architects play in there, what role can each architect in their local environment play in there, and then we don't necessarily not everybody will be a global architect, so make the best of what you can in your local context. And that, I think, is for me something that nature also teaches us. And that's where we're talking about circularity and these kinds of things. So get your own values right. Thanks, clear. Yeah, I, I agree on that, that uh, well, we, we are thinking beings and we are here for a reason. And especially if you're a student, when I was 18, I had different reasons than when I was 19 and then when then I was 20. So I learned on the fly during my stay over here. I come from a very small village to the big city of Delft. And <laughs> then suddenly I learned there are so many other people around there. And uh, they, di they think differently, they act differently, they eat differently. And I learned so much about that, that, that enriched my uh, life a lot. Uh, just being here and not even at the university and then at a certain point I even learned that I liked studying I liked mathematics. I liked what I'm doing or here and biomimicry uh, you started to No, I, I was an aerospace engineer from uh, uh, ah, I had it okay. done and and from an aer engineering point of view I think AI can do a lot because airplane design is easy with computers. It's really easy <laughs> <laughs> it's only calculus. It's only calculus. You can calculate an airplane completely through and it will fly. So I think uh, from an aerospace engineering, they should be worried. I think in our architecture, I think uh, if you look at emotional things which have emotions, that's going to be why something you, different. Why do you think it's so different? Uh, it takes a little, bit, a little while longer, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe it takes longer. And an engineering point of view, I think it's easy. 
it, it, for the computer to pop out uh, an airplane. And just by describing what you need and uh, n not describing any emotion, because an airplane is a very functional thing. Architecture uh, supposedly as well. Yeah, but it has more than only function, I hope. So the same thing accounts for, for, for products and uh, consumer electronics, for instance. It has more than just the brick you have in your, in your trousers. So I that's know. what we should try to do. Do non-functional buildings to be safe from artificial intelligence. <laughs> uh, Saskia. Oh, well, I think we can, um, we can also use AI more to unlock natural intelligence. Um, it, there, there's so much biological mechanisms that we don't yet really understand how they work. Um, so perhaps there's still lots of research that we need to do that AI itself can uh, help assist to, to make that mo move faster. So then also architects can learn better about um, those solutions, make them more really place-based, because sometimes I think we create maybe the most beautiful things, but they are not really fit for the place they they are. Uh, Another plugin, context-driven shape list. Yeah, and and um, so, but this I also think that this this natural intelligence is take, making use of 3.8 billion years of R and D. It's time tested. It's proven. Um, and so, so why why try not try to make maybe yeah. a mix of those? But I it's think very, they can benefit. It's very slow. It was very it slow. Is slow. Evolution is very slow. Yeah, but with our big brains, we can learn from what happened already and then make interesting combinations. In, in the end, I think uh, nature is also like a Lego model. It's only a few building blocks, but it's the reconfiguration that makes all these interesting different things. Yeah, so yeah. we can use AI to make those, these guiding principles and then our own creativity can still come in. Yeah, I also think like if you look into nature, like you said, there's a lot of things we don't know. Uh, we don't know how really small things work, really big things work, really like uh, ocean, uh, the deep ocean. We don't really know much about it. So those questions, like because there's no data on it, like AI can't really do much about right. it. So there's still a lot to be done. And if you look into robots, for example, and you compare them, for example, what humans can do, like just physically, like robots are so far behind, um, like just the bodies of it. And also like if you look into nature, what they can do, like recreating that is just not, we're not there yet. So I think my students can definitely still like solve unanswered questions. Like for example, like they haven't, truly figured out why ice, when you step on it, it's slippery, for example. So like those kind of questions still like need to be solved as well. I didn't get it. Why ice is slippery when you step on it? Yeah, so like when there's the ice, then of course when you, when you step on it, like it's quite slippery, but they haven't really figured out what happens at that interface fully yet. So why is ice slippery? Funny, yeah. Uh, <laughs> True, but yeah, yeah, well, that's what they say, you know, like uh, when your fingers get, when you're in the shower like for 20 minutes, oh, yeah. that your fingers have this mini texture, is wrinkles, is because of that, right? It's because nature has understood that the, the, the floor is wet, so you need better gripping capacity. So your skin adapts to the situation. So, so yeah, you could learn from those things and apply them to, to anything. But like Seran, you have uh, maybe last comment. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, a few minutes we stuck. Minutes we have. Well, um, I would say in terms of education, uh, I would like to trust the new generation to give them the tools, to give them the skills to play uh, with these models, with this new technology, and to see what comes out of it. I've been surprised and amazed with what students come up with that I couldn't think at the first place. So I kind of try to uh, give them the space to experience as much as possible. I think that's uh, what creativity is, right? And one of the reasons I think uh, spe specifically this faculty and architects would be great at it to bring in, uh, let's say, uh, novel and uh, original ideas 
playing with this new technology is that uh, they, the way the design thinking, the, the creative mind of architects could bring something new to this game. Before we close, I, I think there's something that is very interesting from this panel is this interdisciplinarity. Would it make more sense than ever that we have classes of history together with biomimicry? Or should we start to do these crossovers more frequent? Because no? Well, we do have to have more classes of history dot. <laughs> that would be my point. Because, I mean, there's so many engineering disciplines across campus, and you started very nicely saying it's about understanding systems, and these systems exist, and that's exactly what history, in my opinion, should be doing or is doing and ought to do. So we have to position ourselves in time and space. Again, that's where history can come in. So to answer your earlier question, do we still need history? Yes, more than ever, I would say. And also to understand maybe the, the last thing, the understand the systems that we are in and that can hinder us. So we need to be very aware of where we are placed, what kind of forces play out, like you say, the big corporations, and then reshape the environment based on our own values and concepts. And it shapes the society that uh, governs those, yeah. Clear. What do you think of more cross-collaborations? Between, uh, yeah, are you? I, I like it a lot. I think uh, I was, I feel, I, I felt a little bit like the strange duck over here, <laughs> but uh, it's it's fun to talk about this kind of stuff. So especially with the AI, I think there's a lot going on, and we should explore it. And I think our students should explore it. So we have to trust our students on that. So I agree on that, and that's that's one thing I will take away with me over here. Thank you. When you show the picture of the of the bicycle, and this is a bit late from from my side, but like. We have a lot of commonalities with architecture. Architecture is also that picture. Like, uh, of course, with cables and with, with solar panels. And, but yeah. we also have all this assemblage of things that we are just adding few more things and reconfiguring them. But this uh, network of things is uh, pretty similar to what you're saying. So, um, yeah. But there's even drainage in bicycles. There's drainage. There you go. Yeah. That there is a, also like a big difference in how we design things and how nature designs things. Because if you look at like our arm and how it's built, so every lot of functions are integrated in the same structure, it's not stacked. Like for example, a lot of things are just, okay, we have uh, a wall and then we put uh, a window in and we, we put a roof on, but it's not like one structure that like completely has the function of like shelter or whatever function you design for. So in nature, you see a lot of different way of designing and how like these functions are like very robustly integrated and also that some, some things are also redundant. So for example, if you lose uh, like one, like let's say uh, tendon that doesn't work very well, so sometimes your body is like able to like then support still that like movement with another one of the of the tendons, so it's quite interesting how you can relearn certain movements as well. Do you look into the mistakes of nature? Because evolution is made of that as well. Huh? Yeah, there are some like mistakes uh, I wouldn't call, but there are some redundancies. Apparently, like some piano players, there's some tendons in the hand, and uh, they, uh, if you're a really high piano player, they're actually negative uh, for how you can move your hand. So some people like cut the tendon so that they can move their hand better. Is that like a mistake? I don't know. No, nobody has like that issue really. But like for example, like our appendix doesn't have a function anymore. It used to have a function, but we still have it. Like how long will it take for that to go? To go away, say? yeah. yeah. We totally look at mistakes. You always yeah. look at mistakes. No, so you, you, you can, if you do biomimicry, you can look at very specific adaptations of an organism, but you can also look at more abstracted principles. And um, so at some point, biologists, they figured out six, they call them life's principles, and one of them is evolve to survive. And in biology, that would mean sort of 
reproduction passing on your DNA, DNA. There's lots of mutations, which you can see as mistakes. tiny mistakes. And but some, are on purpose. Yeah, some, some can be beneficial and yeah. others are not. And um, I think especially, so for instance, the African elephant has, uh, has more wrinkled skin than the Asian elephant. And it's helping this African elephant to grow larger because now it has more skin, let's say, uh -huh. uh, in the, in, protected from the sun. Mm -hmm. And because it grew bigger, it was less of a prey for, for the lions. So it was a reinforcing feedback loop and, and this is helping. And I think so being open to mistakes and incorporating them if they are beneficial is a really good strategy. Can you add a random factor into your software, like a mistake factor, just to try things, you know, like <laughs> that don't, yeah. doesn't entirely make sense? Uh, I, I didn't get to... to, uh, to On purpose, to, you know, like you're programming Yes, we, we do actually, we do have, we do test models on adversarial uh, attacks or attempts, which are basically not a common usage of the, the model, but for example, this uh, article you referred to, I think it was in New York Times, about uh, someone trying to uh, get chat GPT to talk about love, for yeah. example, which is, this model is not designed to do that. It's not to have a conversation with a chatbot about love and how much do I love you or how much do you love me. So these are the things that, uh, being tested on purpose. So it's like um, sort of approaching the system from an uh, outlier perspective. But I think it's a bit different from actually putting um, mistakes in the system. But anyways, this happens because if you, for example, train this model in large corpus of text or images or whatever it's out there, uh, not all of them are uh, I would say innocent. There are um, wrong or, or they are biased or there are things that shouldn't go there at the yeah. beginning, but... Uh, this is what Carola was saying also. <laughs> Replicating a bit the... So, yeah. so maybe the example we used uh, to train four neural systems, you would know that better, but it really surprised me, on to sort images from Pittsburgh and Tokyo. And these four different neural networks were cheating, I was going to say, in their own ways. So one would be looking at clouds, for example. Well, we, don't, we wanted it to learn about architecture and not about the, the, the clouds. Or it might be looking at just random words. So if there are Chinese characters in there, it might have put it into the Japanese. So you don't actually know what they are learning from. But I think it's important to come back to your question of functionality. So which function does what fulfill? and what that means for architecture. Because I think the, the, the question we, we escaped a bit is the role of the creator in architecture. Because I think in many of the other disciplines, it's not so much anchored to the person, the architects, which we have since Brunelleschi. We didn't used to have that before either. So the role of the one person making these things and being the owner in one way of this design and de the other question is that of functionality. Well, look at this. What kind of function do we have? It's a beautiful, magnificent space. But then if, how do you define functionality in that way anyway? Yeah, I'm not going to say anything about my boss work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no I, you put me in the wrong place. Yeah, maybe you should, should want to comment on that. I can't, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like also, I think like with, if you look at evolution, like it's also a little bit like a random thing. It's all kind of coincidences. So there's not just one best solution always. There's like multiple ones. And in nature, there's just one that survived or, or one that like is out there. But it doesn't mean like there aren't any other solutions out there. But does there. it mean that it's... Because in evolutionary, what I remember from high school is that the one that survived was the best, but actually not necessarily. No, because it can also be that, that like the best one hasn't evolved because there's so many ways of to combining the DNA like that like uh, 
there can just not, like randomly not been the one that was next step, let's say. So it can be that there's like a way better solution out there just yeah. never evolved. But what you see is it's good enough for now in this place, in this context. And if that doesn't work anymore for that place or context, it will fade out. I see. But some of them are amazing, like the shark. The shark's still here, yeah. even though the seas are super polluted. So the guys super are, resilient The guys design. are still around, no problem. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the time is running out. I think I would like to see if anybody from the audience wants to have a question, maybe. Yeah, please. Thank you. It's a really interesting uh, conversation. I have a, a question relating to some of the conversation at the start of the panel, um, specifically about the copying of natural information or information from the, the natural world or the, the built world around us. And it seems to me to be um, perhaps a repeat of the tragedy of the commons in that we're privatising information that was previously collective or... Um, for free. Does any of the panel have any thoughts on how we can protect the common knowledge around us and maintain freedom of access to the, um, this kind of collective of information? I think uh, one thing that, of course, we're already doing quite a lot, but like having a lot of open access uh, information, especially when it comes to how animals work. However, I think we need to step away probably at a, like like 100% from like uh, having things that are copyrighted uh, that came from nature. So maybe everything that comes from nature, which is common knowledge, should just remain common knowledge because it's not something that... Um, uh, because you just got it from nature, but you haven't really um, invented it yourself. That's what I think, but yeah. Do you agree? Ag agree with yeah, the, the I mean. point. Yeah, I, yeah, I think um, the more sort of uh, biological information, if we can make it, uh, well, open access or public available, um, and I know there's a lot of people that, that want to apply that for the, the common good, they will do it. Um, Another thought that I had was, um, I know there's a couple, there's, there's a group of people that are, are trying to make, um, they call it innovation for conservation, because it, as if we don't conserve some of the natural habitats or the organisms itself, we cannot learn from them anymore. So then also that knowledge is disappearing. So there is also something of maintaining the history by protecting it for future use. Yeah. And if, if that is what you want to grow the pie bigger <laughs> with everybody, then it should become, be, be, remain open knowledge. Nice, it's a kind of like a natural heritage. Like a yeah, yeah. So, so and maybe even reward the, the real patent owner then, you know, that if you learn from the zebra, then protect the savanna <laughs> so they can still thrive there. But it's, it's maybe not completely the right answer to this question, but it's the, there's, there's a different mindset also to it, I think, that is needed. And Was it answer? You are still what, or you are still one more brainstorming on this, yeah? <laughs> Well, maybe I can comment a little bit on that because there's, there's other means, for instance, laws. We can build laws or so around AI and how to use AI for the future use. And uh, especially if, if you have access to open data and you're going to put it behind a paywall, then we can prohibit that. We can stop that. And that's something which might be a solution for that. And the EU is already looking at, okay, how to build laws around AI. But while we're not only in the EU, we are also Russia, there's also China, there's also Africa and America. So there are different countries. So I think we, we, we will be actually too slow in that sense. If, 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 and, and people will take benefit of it, definitely. They will make money out of it, that's for sure. 
that's that's how we actually are being nurtured uh, last uh, couple of centuries, I think, unfortunately. But don't you think, like, if, for example, we get laws in the EU saying that we can't use that data and put it behind a paywall, and then uh, America says, no, 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 it's fine, we can do it. I think that's, that's a big issue. Yeah, I agree on that. So uh, that's a big issue. But uh, then again, in the US, there's more possible now with, for instance, Google, and in the EU, it's not possible to actually get all the data from you uh, uh, over here. So then suddenly laws help. They really help. It's not allowed over here. It might be allowed in the US, but... but maybe then bring it back to this faculty in some ways, because I do think it's about design thinking. And legal studies might want to do more design rather than being reactive, because mostly the laws come around when the disaster has already happened. So that's, again, to think about what kind of society do we want to live in. And then, I mean, I, I don't know if this example would work, but in nature we have a lot of predators, right? So if we think about predators today, but there are also enough of small fishies around or plants that in their massa can oppose or sh change the balance. So maybe the multitude of open access and sharing can be the balance to the, to the predator that we are thinking about. Can DDoS I? attack or not? <laughs> Just a bit conclude about uh, all you said, uh, reservation, uh, predators. So let's uh, make universities great again. So we are uh, public institutes. If we own data, then we make it public. Then it's not in the hand of just few corporations, right? Yeah, the data might be in the hand of everybody, but they have the tools that we don't have. That's the concentration of power they have. That's a bit the problem, that they just release one version of ChatGPT, but, but in, their, in, the com in the company, they already had several, and they still have several in tools that are completely for their own sake. But how did this happen? So one Why thing the is the data, the other thing is the tools. Into Google, not if the tools are for everybody, I agree. But while the tools remain in the hands of five companies, Huh. But why this happened? So that's uh, why this happened in the first place. So we were uh, universities, when I'm referring to we, universities where the entities were doing research in, in AI back in time, and all of a sudden disappeared. All the minds went to uh, big corporations, and of course they have the data, they have the minds, they have the computation, and then Power. create something for... But then we should be aware of this. I mean, the society, the public, Policymakers should be aware of this and then um, sort of reinforce the balance, right? It's sort of a reservation of where these things are happening. So the front end research should go back to universities which are doing research for public good. That's a nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Javier, maybe you want to say some few last words? Uh, well, I want to say, first of all, thank you all for the uh, really animated and alive debate. I think, uh, I think that the conversation to me now, uh, it's already food for thoughts for the next Big A Talks. I think that there are issues that we haven't spoken about. I, I mentioned earlier uh, something or during my introduction, we are flooded by news every day. You open the newspaper, any website or any, any let's say, uh, um, serious newspaper, we have alarming news no, about what's coming. I have the impression that every day I wake up with this kind of AI tsunami and uh, I don't know so much about it, as you know very well. I have been trained by my students on ChatGPT yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I think I have a lot to catch up on. But I do read the news and I read in the newspaper, so it was kind of a joke. I think that we... I didn't hear anything about those alarming news. I don't know if for you these are not alarming news, actually. This is what I, I actually wonder. I don't know if the question or it's a wrap-up because we need to go because we are strict with time. So, but I, yeah, I feel still tempted to ask you all, uh, what do you think of former AI pioneers leaving Google in order to inform the public that the AI takeover is maybe more urgent than the climate emergency. More dangerous. Oh, 
more dangerous. More dangerous. I don't know what... Is it something that you are thinking of or you consider that we are uh, in the middle of an amazing revolu uh, technological revolution that will just, like the DU Delph tends to think that technology will save us from anything? Is there anything you want to say about those alarming news? At least to me, they are quite alarming. Please go. I, th I think you can use technology for the greater good, but also for the greater bad. And uh, that's, that's something which uh, is always the case if we develop uh, 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 fusion energy, for instance, then it can be used for uh, as an energy supply, but we can also make bombs out of it. And I think that's what research is all about. We don't want to make bombs. We want to make stuff that actually makes this world a better place. And that's, uh, that's what I always uh, see forehand. That's always my, my view in a positive sense. And yes, you can use it for the, for the greater bad. That's unfortunate. But we have to live with it. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I hear something like that, I probably don't know enough of AI to be able to assess if that is correct. But it could also be that they don't know enough about climate change to say if it's a just statement. So I, I really don't know. <laughs> what, what is? <laughs> I think it needs to be put in context, no? Because I, we we just we are just talking about a certain title. The yeah. article, of course, develops a lot more. And what the author says is that don't take me wrong. It's not that I, I am undermining the climate emergency, mm -hmm. no? And so we I'm, we are th taking things out of context, and that's also very dangerous. Which is very dangerous when I look at or use Chat GPT, uh, taking things out of context and. Uh, the manipulation of truth, no? And uh, the recreation of a different truth. That's something that also comes to mind when, when thinking about we're thinking about what we can do with, uh, with these new tools, no? Which for sure are extremely useful for design students. I don't say the opposite. But I wonder if we as educators, and we are all educators here, are also letting students know of of all these other sides. You know, sometimes I have the impression that we are in front always of uh, students and we are telling them, trust technology, it's, it's great, use it, do it. I don't know, I don't know if we are being um, broad enough, if we are giving all the sides of the spectrum when we talk about this. Uh, but Carola issue. said that she's going to ask students to write by hand. Yeah, I mean, we, we are doing this. So, I mean, that would be the basic example, but I think our t our task is to educate critical minds. And where and how, we, I mean, this is, this is why we are here, and let them think on their own. I don't want a student coming back to me say, oh, I make it sustainable by putting a solar panel on it, or I make it smart, <laughs> and I build so many more data centers which will make climate change even worse, because that's when we're do, doing the, the data power than four. Right? So it's the same thing, I mean, for me, looking at history, when I've been, write of, I've been writing on, on the petroleum revolution, the, the way that petroleum has been built into our society, which makes us all dependent on it, from our clothes for plastics to whatever, cars, mobility, etc., it is also a fun part. And I think there, for me, the biggest danger is that you get so excited about it that you trust smart buildings to do everything for you, but in the end, they are not smart because they are taking even more energy, which is exactly the opposite what, what, from the thing that we wanted to achieve. So that is a danger for the faculty to believe in, but that's exactly what, I'm at least, what I at least am trying to do, whether we look at history where we've gone wrong, to look at global processes. But on the other hand, if you look at OECD having a survey now on localizing the blue economy, there is a return to locality. And I do think if we can understand how each element is embedded in the local context and should be adding value to its local context, which is also the comments question that you asked, that's where we might be going. Is it scary? Is it going that way? Sure. But at this point, I don't think it helps. I think for our students, we have to give them the, the thinking power, the creativity to say, you can make a difference. And if I ask my students, how many of you have a driving license, it is already different from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there is, I think we should not just radio, radio, radiate panic, but we need to trust, and I think that's what you said too, we need to empower them to, for, being individual critical thinkers. And that's what also democ democracy is entirely built upon, I think. 
Okay, I think we should go on, and we will go on in a bit later. But we need to we need to uh, <laughs> close down the conversation. Uh, thank you very much again to all of you for the for the debate. I think we should go on uh, talking about this. Is definitely a lot of food for, food for thoughts. Um, I'm going to say goodbye till the uh, next BK talks. Next uh, BK talks will take place. Uh, uh, in sorry, this is not working. Yes, I'm going to change topic. Complete different thing. Uh, next June 15th, uh, the Biki Talks will be uh, broadcasted, li broadcasted live from the city of Venice. Uh, as you all know already, uh, we have been uh, we organized an exhibition which is called BK Africa that has to do with the work done uh, uh, with partnerships and by students and faculty uh, uh, here at TU Delft at the Faculty of Architecture on the African continent from many points of view. So we try to look at Africa uh, throughout uh, a lot of different lenses. And we will celebrate uh, the next BK Talks on the 15th of June, as I said, from Palazzo Mora, where this, the exhibition that you see here in the Auxerre is traveling. So a selection of the work will be shown uh, in Venice uh, starting next week. And uh, we hope that you join online on 15, uh, June 15th to talk about uh, <laughs> A different topic, uh, but as interesting as the one we have been discussing today. So welcome to Africa next uh, June 15th. Thank you very much.